Okay, just before um, I do start the lecture, um, how, how many people were actually here last week? Have we got quite a number of people who were here with listening to Mona? Because I want to try and link back to um, Mona a bit last week. Um, the other thing is that when, when I got home after the lecture last week, um, I um, received a message through personal messages on Facebook to the RAG site which was a very heartfelt and rather upset message um, to say that um, the, the person was expressing concerns about um, certain anti-trans commentary and, um, and attitudes in RAG that she felt was being expressed. Um, so she said she'd come to, to a couple of RAG lectures, I don't know which other one, but last week in particular, and said that last week, um, any person, any trans-identified person, might have felt upset. Um, and I thought about that, I reflected about that, um, and tried to respond to her. Um, in particular, I was responding that when it comes to hunter-gatherers, just as Mona was telling us, egalitarianism is never simple, it's, it's incredibly complicated, complex and difficult, so with hunter gatherers, gender is never simple, it's incredibly complex. Um, but I, when I reflected, I thought, well, yes, there actually was some items in the conversation, in the questions and discussion, which a trans person might have felt was, you know, just was, was getting too close, that was possibly attacking or making them feel uncomfortable. Um, so, uh, we, we've just got to reflect a little bit on issues of safe space here um, and I think that this may be a discussion that would be good for RAG at the AGM which is going to happen in four weeks on July the 10th and to which anybody is very very welcome um, that we should so that the chair's responsibility is to make sure that anyone who's engaged in the discussion feels okay and, and protected and, and can lift their voice. Um, if we think about RAG's models, models and evolution, um, the evolution of language for instance, to a large degree the evolution of language is the evolution of safe space, isn't it? Um, safe space means anybody can speak and feel that their voice will be heard with respect. Um, now there are a few of us around in here, we, we, if we remember Mona last week, she was talking about um, this uh, the source of morality, as organic corporeal morality, that there was such intensive, um, that we find in a hunter-gatherer society, for instance, such intensive intersubjectivity, such a kind of feeling in the solar plexus, she was relating it to these concepts I've written up on the board, um, for instance, for the Jeune Poissy, Aquila, Bayaka, Epeme, the Hadza, that, that they are concepts of transformation and change where people are sensing them in each other, with each other, and kind of going with each other. And she was contrasting that aspect of morality to a kind of hierarchical aspect of command and control where somebody is saying at, at the top, you know, you, you are in that box and you are in that box and you... So you back me up, Ingrid. Hunter gatherer peoples, that they, they are never trying to define or say what another person is like or should be like or how they should live. Or they may have a lot of arguments. They may do masambo and rant and say you were being stupid, you did something stupid. But they will never say you shouldn't be the way you are. Absolutely not. And hunter gatherers have a, a powerful. Um, value of diversity and that, that everybody in the camp has different different abilities, different so yeah. So Mona was really contrasting those, those those two types of morality. In fact she contrasted one as the real source of morality to another as kind of an anti morality, if you like. That sort of aspect of controlling and and fixing things down. Now all these concepts are about the opposite of fixity. They're taking their, their concepts of fluidity, change, constant transformation. Um, so I'm kind of saying stuff which should be self-evident um, for us, for everybody. Rag had a really proud record all the way with you know, issues of, of gay rights, 
from the very early starts, LBGTQI plus should be second nature for RAG, actually. Um, so we, we've just got to attune ourselves on that. If there is any reason why um, uh, anybody would feel uncomfortable, this should be safe space for everybody, whoever it is, including unreconstructed Marxist dinosaurs like me or Robin um, and Chris, but, uh, and for trans identity people, obviously. Um, so having said that, um, uh, I want to try and relate a bit more back to, to Mourner, so I'm, I'm going to actually start, I want to kick off, yeah. Um, and, um, is this flat? Um, yeah, if it, I'm going to talk about evolution, obviously, today. Um, so, from a perspective, like a trans identity or gender fluid perspective, evolution must look like horribly heterosexist and cis. I mean, come on. You know, the one thing we know, <laughs> the one thing we know about our ancestors is um, they did heterosexual acts, pretty cis. Um, that's for sure. We we don't know much else about them, but we know that because otherwise we wouldn't then be here. And um, so it may appear on the surface that evolutionary models have to be horribly sexist, have to be horribly reductionist, um, and yet we say absolutely the contrary, um, that RAG's perspectives, RAG's models, are actually giving us an evolutionary perspective onto um, the whole range of human sexuality, the whole variety of human gender performance and practice, indeed. Um, and I can say that all the research I've done in respect of RAG has been focused on gender, um, informed by hunter-gatherer gender cosmology um, for, for, for many decades. Um, so that's, that, that's kind of always been part of RAG's models. And even in this picture here, we're kind of getting girls versus boys. I'll say more about this when I come to it again later. Um, it all looks quite but actually it's not because the sexes are swapping around in their roles and, and in the imagination of what they are capable of um, and what powers they have. So this is actually extraordinarily fluid performance in this ritual being performed amongst young Hadza people. Um, so uh, the focus in this, this discussion, gender, did gender egalitarianism make us human, is very much on uh, uh, female strategies. Because uh, I'm an old Marxist dinosaur, I, have, uh, I look at very material economic problems, problems of energy. So the material story of human evolution is the problem of energy. How did mothers get enough energy to give birth to increasingly, to, to raise, as the human lineage evolved, increasingly large-brained offspring. This is a, a problem of energy. How did they manage to do it? Um, but in the course of doing that, in the course of solving that, that problem, which was fundamentally, so it's fundamentally a female problem, so as a Marxist, I expect, that there must be resistance amongst females and females are gonna salute, solve that problem because it's their problem. Um, in the course of doing that, there are a number of ways in which others and other genders get involved in that. Um, so first of all, um, females are, um, we have the example of Sarah Hurdy's book, Mothers and Others, with a cooperative breeding. So, females need others in the support and the the first who is the other in support is the mother's mother fundamentally now that is kind of constrained by evolution that's kind of constrained by biology and by the facts of selfish genes you know so we've got um, selfish gene biology kind of under, underlying the darwinian models here that the mother's mother will have sufficient cooperation to work with her daughter uh, um, for the children. But as soon as Sarah Hurdy is arguing that that cooperation gives rise to what we call intersubjectivity, the ability to start seeing ourselves as others see us. 
And as that's happening, then you start getting what Tomasello refers to as self-other equivalences. So you can start to change your carer from being your mother to her sister, to her aunt, to uh, brothers. To So the self-other equivalence means that this, this potential of care spreading, cooperation, spreads out and out and out very rapidly to include absolutely anybody. Or carers until the point where hunter, in hunter-gatherer camps all adults are carers of all children. That is the ultimate point that it reaches. Yep. Um, secondly, the female strategies um, w involve or necessarily will involve the female strategies required to enlist sufficient support and investment for their large-brained offspring requires coalitions of everyone. Okay. Um, so they can't exclude anybody from the coalitions. They need the help of everyone. Against who? Who is the enemy? The enemy is a would-be alpha male, um, a, a male that is intent on grabbing pussy without, w without in academic terms, without um, providing investments. Okay. So that is like the enemy that everyone is in coalition against. So that coalition of everyone includes all of us, everybody, all ages, all sexes, all genders. The third thing that the female strategies, the evolutionary, so these are evolutionary strategies, do is they produce a revolution onto a whole new level, uh, the level of symbolic communication. Something completely new happens coming out, emerging from this female strategies with the coalition of everyone. Um, and this is symbolic culture. Now what I wanted to say was to draw attention to these extraordinary concepts that Mona was taking us through last, last week. These concepts um, for the Jeune Troisi, um, the Bushmen in, in uh, Kalahari, uh, Bushmen group, um, an idea of potency, the thing is we can't translate these names, these words, but potency that it associates to the transformations in a girl's first menstruation ritual, uh, uh, healing rituals, um, ekila of the Bayaka Benjele, um, uh, associated to, again, a whole array of different meanings. Um, Epeme in the Hadza, so this, this uh, ritual of Maitoko is connected to the Epeme complex of the Hadza. Um, and we, we cannot translate these words, uh, actually. They, they don't have a specific meaning. What it is about them is that they are always changing and changing their meanings. They're always transforming. What they, what they seem to me to be are the, a kind of nuclear fissile core that goes all the way back to the very origin of symbolic culture itself and the creation of meaning itself. That what is symbol, what is metaphor, it is that one thing stands for another thing which it isn't. And it's a purely arbitrary, conventional creation of meaning. So these words are exactly that. That capacity, that human capacity of symbolic cognition to agree a meaning and then change and again agree a meaning and again change. So what's happening in these, what Mona was telling us of these, these rituals where the energy is like feeling all the way up. It just goes from the solar plexus all the way up our spines and is kind of joining the community so powerfully is that it, people are able to jump, share a meaning, understand each other, jump again, share a meaning. So this is changing all the time, changing all the time. Nothing could be more uh, demonstrating the closeness, the intimacy, the empathy, the um, you know, intersubjectivity, the, the, this mutual understanding, mind reading. Um, it's not just mind reading, it's like solar plexus le reading, as Mourner was describing the, the corporal uh, source of morality uh, last. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that anyone coming from a, a gender fluid perspective, looking at these models of the emergence of language, the emergence of symbolism, what is symbolism? It, it is the overthrow of brute reality. 
What is gender? It is the overthrow of brute realities of sex, in, in, in my view. And these words, these concepts from African hunter-gatherer groups are right at the heart of how these things happen. How did they, how did they happen? How are they still happening? Um, is uh, what I was uh, wanting to express um, in relation to that very you know, provoked and heartfelt comment from last week by, by um, somebody who is here listening at RAG. Um, so RAG is, uh, RAG's evolutionary models are just, uh, I'm going to defend them completely, that they are not reductive. Even though we are dealing with hunter-gatherer lives where uh, men and women may be doing quite different things in the sex division of labor, this, this is still, you know, the, these are still societies that are amongst the most gender egalitarian on earth. Um, and I'm going to talk about and defend that um, in, in this, this argument today. Um, did, it, did anybody want to make any comments regarding the last week or, or um, what, any feelings about last week at all? So, yeah, Dominic? I, I agree with you. I think last week there's a lot of focus on what a wonderful thing um, bringing up children is for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think that could be misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, if I, yeah, I mean, I think yeah that, that, that's a possibility but I think everybody thought that was uh, expressed with an intense positivity um, I'm going to claim that the gender egalitarian one of the indices of gender egalitarianism must be how much resources go to mothers and children although of course child carers today do not necessarily have to be female in hunter-gatherer camps a large proportion of the child carers do have to be female but of course that's not true today um, for us anyway um, so yeah that's that's a possibility and um, I think there were perfectly legitimate comments in the in the discussion last week like you know a Marxist perspective that is saying well today we are having we are getting all these issues arising for certain reasons at this point in history that's a perfectly legitimate debate um, but making comments like um, a childless woman doesn't care about children or something like that or gay people don't understand the problems of families that that's not that's absolutely not legitimate at all and we know that yeah we, we, we all know that um, anybody else had any Thoughts? Yeah. Without, without yeah it, uh, that's what I was trying to say no, that it just the, spreads to a children, point where mums and dads and stuff mm. it, doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you gave birth to them or not they're, Any, they're children, they're uh, anybody and, and everybody will be participating in the childcare for, uh, for the children that, that's an absolute um, and really we can compare to some extent we can compare the status of women in hunter-gatherer camps to women in our society you know the the extent to which we spend on nuclear weapons trident compared to the extent to which is spent on nursery or pre-nursery care for or, or, or child care um, it, you know that's just an imbalance an, an outrageous imbalance that, that those resources should be put in towards uh, children's uh, schooling and children's care um, which of course they they are in in hunter-gatherer camps okay that's a mosambo <laughs> so let's um, let, let's get to the the, the, the grist of it um, sorry yeah I, what were the comments that um, were complained about specifically? I, d I didn't get into the nitty gritty about it or say particularly, but I thought about it um, and thought that there might have been some, um, the sorts of things that I was just saying. I mean, there were just stereotyped comments about how, you know, the, the kinds of things that I, I don't think we need to. We can discuss in the pub more. It's not necessary here. I don't know uh, anybody from last week who, who heard and thought it was, but, I, but I, somebody was moved to um, say, well, she, she was saying that she felt UCL had very anti-trans, uh, lacked a safe space, and she was saying um, 
that specifically that rag she hoped would be better but she was finding not um, but I had a good exchange with her and she said she would be coming today I don't know if she did um, I couldn't meet her yet um, okay we can we can take this and develop it on I think it's a good idea for us to attune to to the the comments I, I thought they were at least you know well they should be listened to of course um, okay so we've heard from Chris that um, I, I kind of I, I actually put this lecture together for a um, group of students at Kent University who were interested in the RAG models but um, I was also provoked to come and talk again here back in March during the um, anthro strike um, uh, happenings and we actually spoke on the picket line on, on one occasion um, and Greyburn went and it was in response to Greyburn Wengro's um, article which appeared in a, an online uh, magazine called Eurozine um, the reference to that if you google Graeber Wengro and Eurozine you will find it um, the reference to it is in the little pamphlet which is down at the back and they were they're really concerned with the story about the origins of inequality um, and basically uh, Wengro's an archaeologist David Graeber famous cultural anthropologist they feel that there is a, a, a huge myth out there um, that um, hunter-gatherers supposedly we, ha we lived as happy, go lucky, egalitarian hunter-gatherers for tens of thousands of years in the early, you know, early human existence until, well happy campers they sometimes say, but they didn't say that in this article actually, until farming came along and lo and behold there's all this stratification, all, all this inequality, it's a kind of Rousseau-esque myth, myth, myth about the, the first man who put up a fence um, and and this created all the this created a kind of fall from the Garden of Eden and people became so unequal and all the troubles all the warfare all the slavery all the rape all the mayhem happened in response uh, as a result they do not like this story um, they like to show that hunter-gatherers can have slavery too they can have both slavery and they can have egalitarianism and what's more they can move between the two during maybe a, a year or seasons um, and they tried to show this with evidence from the Upper Paleolithic looking at burials in the Upper Paleolithic um, they also like to show that um, farming cultures may have very significant indices of egalitarianism including like Neolithic farmer villaging uh, village systems like Chattel Hook um, and they want to um, defend civilization against all the charges that have been made including by Marxists they never mention Engels actually Engels for some reason is completely kept out of their discussion um, but they they want to defend civilization and say well humans have been just as good at resisting being oppressed in civilization as they ever were amongst hunter-gatherers and there's probably just as much bad stuff amongst hunter-gatherers um, as uh, as amongst um, you know, sin, uh, uh, human civilizations and cultures that have arisen since our, upper pa our Paleolithic hunter-gatherer past. Um, what confuses me about Graeber and Wengro is that they keep on saying they are just talking about the last 30,000 years the upper paleolithic and they point to upper paleolithic hunter-gatherers as having as what are called complex hunter-gatherers which implies complexity implies political hierarchy or stratification now from Mourner's talk last week already we should be resi we should be querying this badly um, querying this loudly uh, does do you have to wait for hierarchy to have complexity you know it's not totally surprising that archaeologists like to because hierarchy brings them more interesting structures and more complex structures like oh pyramids and oh megaliths and oh all kinds of interesting things archaeologists probably aren't so keen on egalitarianism as they are on hierarchy there's maybe not so much to see for in hunter-gatherer grass huts so there's not so much exciting stuff um, yeah, so they try to say they're talking about 30,000 years 
but actually they keep slipping back into diatribes of you know, the ways that hunter-gatherers uh, you know, could be just as bad in maybe warfare or in slavery or in um, gender relations. They have all kinds of sort of you know, smears about uh, about um, domesticity, uh, living, you know, me men and women just living in small groups. Oh, there's going to be all this domestic violence going. They never say that. They're kind of implying it in there. <sighs> oh, okay. I'll forgive you. But they really aren't talking about human origins. So if their, their thesis is about the Upper Paleolithic having a lot of political, what they call complexity, which means, which, by which they mean variability, that means some people in the Upper Paleolithic may be hierarchical, some people may be egalitarian, and especially they have a model of people moving between the two and changing through the seasons, um, that's okay. And arguing that, okay, there may not, you know, the shift from hunting, gathering to farming may have been a very creeping process. I don't mind that, that's okay, that's fine, that's almost surely to be true. That there may be a lot of resistance. Um, um, people didn't just lie down and get oppressed, they didn't just accept hierarchy and tyranny. There were many, uh, you know, ma many issues of religion and politics involved. Um, that's okay. But if they start saying they're talking about human origins and there are places where it feels like that's what they're doing, then they really can't. They just don't have the qualifications to do it for these reasons. They are saying absolutely nothing whatsoever about evolution. They don't even discuss human evolution at all. Um, they don't have a lot of expertise to do it either. Um, they say almost nothing about sex or gender. Um, it, they, and, and I just want to pose, you know, po just hold on that. If you're going to discuss egalitarianism and you don't discuss sex or gender, how does that, that surely is a huge hole. It's just, it, they have only very incidental f things to say regarding sex and gender and nothing that's germane to their argument. Um, so how can you speak about inequality at all? It, or e equality at all. I, d I don't see. And the other thing they do is they have nothing about Africa. Everything is, is focused on Europe and the Upper Paleolithic or the um, subsequent stages of history, so uh, the periods of history. So the continent on which we evolved as modern humans and where we have been modern humans, I'm not just talking about distant hominins, I'm not just talking about hominins way back in time, I'm talking about modern humans, homo sapiens, where we've been homo sapiens more than twice as long as anywhere else on earth is not mentioned or hardly mentioned um, only to to say something about a few um, modern day hunter-gatherers and even that is extremely inaccurate discussion so I'm gonna say Grave and Wengro you actually aren't talking about human origins okay as long as you admit it that's fine um, but isn't the interesting question, rather than being the origins of inequality, from an evolutionary perspective, how did we actually become, um, how, it, it, it's not how we got to be unequal, but how did we become equal? Because if you look at that from a perspective of, of uh, primates, non-human primates, whose societies are very much organized through dominance and subordination, and where there is rank hierarchy determining enormously the fitness of animals, the outcome for fitness of these uh, of primates. You know, to become egalitarian is, from a Darwinian perspective, enormously puzzling. Where did that come from? How did that happen? So egalitarianism is seen by most people, Graeber and Wengro are trying to argue it, um, but most people will accept that a significant uh, a number of hunters, not every hunter-gatherer culture, there are differences, but what are known by James Woodburn as immediate return hunter-gatherers have a very serious degree of egalitarianism. Um, and so how did that arise and, and is this a deep time phenomenon and I believe it must be um, and how did that arise is it a part of our evolutionary past I believe it must be and it is um, and I'm going to 
show you areas of evidence that I think prove we had this egalitarian past. Let's just say a few things about gender egalitarianism, what that implies. Can we define that a little bit more? Um, so James Woodburn, in his discussion of egalitarianism in relation to immediate return hunter-gatherers, stressed that for hunter-gatherers, egalitarianism is asserted. It is constantly being worked at. You had to keep making sure that anybody who tries to get their head above the parapet and tries to act as the boss gets pulled down and make sure that that egalitarianism is. It isn't a given, it's not like a human right, it's something that people work at. And Mona last week was t telling us about that, uh, about how people are, so, are so, this constant kind of interaction that maintains egalitarianism. Um, people are hunter-gatherer, uh, uh, people are always autonomous and they are incredibly protective of their autonomy. They, they w uh, will maintain autonomy, their ability to make their decisions, to find their food and whatever resources they, ha they, they need. Uh, above all, it's, it's something very strong for hunter-gatherer people and that would of course apply to women as well. Um, agency and decision making kind of linked to autonomy as, as extremely strong value for hunter-gatherers. Economic independence, even amongst the Hadza for instance, where, where I've worked, children at even five or six years of age, by seven years of age, they're pretty much, they can find whatever they need. They're pretty much economically independent. If you have that, you're, you can make what you need to live, you can find what you need to eat, nobody can tell you what to do because you've got that capacity to look after yourself. So nobody can boss you. Um, as far as women are concerned in terms of gender egalitarianism, evidently control over sexual and reproductive life is just a fundamental. That, that would be a fundamental that we would expect. Um, now we do see, and that was part of what I was talking about at the beginning, that there are differences in sex roles in hunter-gatherer sex division of labour. This is very common, it's very normal. Um, there sometimes is overlap of roles and there's flexibility, but sometimes certain things men do, some things women do. But the fact of difference does not necessarily imply superiority, inferiority or hierarchy. Not necessarily at all. And in fact, we get this a lot of work being done to assert the interdependency of men doing certain things with women doing certain things and that they really are interdependent on each other and that is again a form of assertion of egalitarianism. Um, and when we come to symbolic items which is coming back to our famous concepts here symbolic um, these, these volatile and fluid symbolic concepts um, reproductive taboos particularly uh, I was talking last week in an event to do with um, menstrual uh, menstruation matters and menstrual taboos and it has happened in the past that feminist anthropologists particularly even where they cannot see very much you know d uh, reduction of women's status in the actual real life which you know, for hunter-gatherers that's usually the case women will the uh, feminists may point to reproductive taboos to menstruation taboos and say look you see woman's being devalued there she's got to you know observe certain taboos well for a start most of those taboos are operating not just on the woman but on everyone who's around her including the men absolutely including the men and secondly these taboos uh, do not con uh, do not have any concept of pollution at all. They do have a concept of power. The concepts that are written up on the board, Mom, Ekila, Epimet, they are all what can be termed ideologies of blood. Now that idea is that the blood from women and the blood from game animals must be kept apart. But then the strange thing is that when a man is hunting, when he shoots an arrow, well, the metaphor for a girl who's menstruating is to shoot an arrow. And when a woman is pregnant, um, he, the way her husband tracks through the forest may affect, and the, the way he, he approaches certain animals may affect her fetus. So the, pregnant, the tracking of an animal and the pregnancy of the woman are 
they get intertwined with each other. This is again an example of these kind of completely separated uh, sort of roles or, or taboo powers being conflated and brought together. So a woman giving birth and a, a man killing a game animal and the blood falling on the earth become equivalent processes that almost change, they almost turn into each other. So there's an extraordinary equivalence actually being established in these very gendered, sim in this very gendered symbolism. Um, so these are aspects of going from sort of the basic economic aspects um, of, of personal and political life to um, symbolic aspects in which we would expect gender egalitarianism. Now Frank Marlow, who's a great um, evolutionary ecologist with the Hadza, um, working there for many years, um, using a, a large sample of hunter-gatherers, uh, the sample he uses is always the, the most relevant from an evolutionary perspective. That is warm climate hunter-gatherers with non-equestrian. He doesn't include any hunter-gatherers who've taken in horses or for evident reasons. So they're warm, warm climate hunter-gatherers, the most relevant for our evolution, including many of the African hunter-gatherers. And he, he tried to identify what things tend to lead to a greater egalitarianism in the, the particular society. Um, and he came up with these factors. Mobility, highly significant. And we have quite a lot of studies which show that when hunters sedentarize, women particularly lose out. When they start settling down, women lose out from the ability to move about and use their networks and gain support. If, if, they don't, if they're having a bad time with, in, in one community, okay, move out and find support elsewhere. So mobility is a key um, aspect. That goes along with multi-local residence. The ability the hunter-gatherers have to live, they may live with a wife's family, they may go and live with a husband's family, or they may go and live in their own place and, and, and other, uh, other friends or, or, or relations. Um, they have a, a creative capacity for creating these fictive relationships, fictive kinship, finding pathways of kinship to anybody that they, you know, that, that they really want to establish the links with. Um, Multi-local residence is part of the, the support structure very strongly. Then the third thing, which is really quite significant, again in relation to arguments that can be made by some feminists, feminists suggest sometimes that if you have a, a division of labor with men hunting large animals and women not allowed to hunt, that's the way it's often put, not allowed to hunt, then surely the men are gaining much more status and superiority and the women are somehow regarded as, as inferior. That their being not allowed to hunt makes them in that. Okay, well Marlowe was actually finding that in societies where there is more hunting of large game, and that applies to hunt African hunter-gatherers who are the par example warm climate hunters of large game, um, women have better status. They have greater solidarity, they have better protection, better ability to um, defend themselves. Um, central praise provisioning, this what he termed instant fluid coalitions. And what, what the role of instant fluid coalitions is, um, has is whether that's coming from children or whether that's coming from women or just whoever it might be, those coalitions ensure that somebody turns up to take hold of the food. Whatever food there is around the camp, coming into the camp, somebody takes it and takes hold of it. Um, So-called demand sharing, uh, ability to just get control of that food. The person who's hunted the food, so we're looking at these, uh, these are Kalahari Kho hunters coming back with a fantastic um, Hemsbok antelope they are not going to be able to keep hold and keep control of that. Other people will take that food away. So we do not have any such situation as men um, keeping a control over resources and using that to leverage and influence and, and, make and, and control women or children at all. It just doesn't happen in, in this situation. 
And um, the weaponry is an interesting part of it, but if you if you have poisoned arrows, which is characteristic for Bushmen or the Hadza or Bayaka as well, um, any I mean a poisoned arrow, you anybody can use it to injure anybody. So this puts a to injure and kill anybody. Um, it puts people in a very, you know, people have to be very, very careful about how they treat each other in that situation because anybody has the capacity. You know, women do not no normally handle poison arrows um, and usually there is a strong prohibition against that, but anybody can, fundamentally. Um, so anybody has that power. Okay, so these are, these are the factors that seem to be contributing to egalitarianism in modern-day hunter-gatherers. Um, but what I want to look at is evolution and you know, where are the areas that we have evidence of egalitarian tendency in evolution, what it actually is. Oh, okay, well this will come to a natural break. Let me just, just give you uh, a few... Um, points here and then you could do your change of mountain. Um, so um, I'm going to cover, so wh wh where is there evidence in, in human evolution and why does that have to be gender egalitarianism? It isn't just any abstract egalitarianism, it is specifically gender egalitarianism. Okay, why don't you change over? Cool. So these are the areas of evidence I'm, I'm going to try and cover or, um, for time. I'm going to focus most, mostly on the evidence in our bodies, the evidence of our, our bodies, our psychology, um, our life history. And this is to me just compelling and you know, it's, it's uh, unanswerable evidence. You, it, it just says we evolved as an increasingly egalitarian genus and then species. Um, we will bring up some aspects of strategies of counter-dominance and reverse dominance in the ethnography of African hunter-gatherers. I'm focused on Africa, not very apologetically, because, because that is the continent on which we evolved, um, and a little bit on the archaeology. But because we've seen a lot of these areas you know, from Mourna last week, from um, Dasha and Jerome and others um, in the recent past at RAG, I'm going to mainly look at that. Okay, this is it. Um, the species biology. So, okay. Um, so, um, Sarah, I'm, I'm referring here to Sarah Hurdy's uh, fantastic book, Mothers and Others, um, simply the best book uh, written on human evolution this century. If you haven't read it and you want to know about human evolution, that is the place to go. There isn't any better. Um, I certainly think David Graeber and, and David Wengro ought to read that book. Um, and what she does in there is really try to explain, Sarah Hurdy we should, should give her background as the leading evolutionary anthropologist on the planet who's a very Darwinian, selfish gene, sociobiologist but also feminist. Um, the leader of the feminist turn in sociobiology effectively. And she has a history of books from uh, The Woman That Never Evolved, um, Mother Nature, and ultimately this one, Mothers and Others, is the, the kind of culmination. She worked originally with Langer primates, um, the small temple monkeys, the Hanuman temple monkeys, and was observing their behavior, and in particular, particular the female strategies that occurred amongst Langers to counteract male infanticide of their infants. So this was, this was kind of seared into her consciousness at a very early stage. So she knows a, she's a hugely expert primatologist. She, she's just uh, encyclopedic and one of the greatest scholars on the planet in terms of primatology. Um, and so she's asking the question, what really makes us different from the other great apes? What do we do that's different? You know, the other great apes have so many capacities that are so similar to us. Um, but these qu this quality that we can call intersubjectivity, um, which is m mind reading that goes in two directions. It's not just mind reading, but it's uh, understanding the mental state, the emotional state of the other individual and being prepared for the other individual to understand your emotional state. It's intersubjectivity. So what Sarah Hurdy argues, she has a very straightforward story 
about how did that happen to us in our ancestry, but it really doesn't happen to great apes. Great apes don't do intersubjectivity. Not even the bonobos do, really. Um, so they're very interested. Great apes are hugely interested in knowing what each other's going to do. They want to find out, what are you, what's he going to do next? What's she going to do next? They're watching. They're, they're listening. They're watching that. But they're not interested or not motivated to let the other ape know what they, th what, what, what they are thinking, what that, that individual's thinking. They're not interested in inviting them in. So Sarah Hurdy's story is this is just so simple. He, she says, um, what set up the pressures for intersubjectivity is as simple as a mother, for the first time, a hominin mother in, in hominin evolution, gave her baby to another individual. And great apes never do that. A great ape mother will only, will only in very exceptional circumstance, um, take, give her vulnerable baby to another individual. It just doesn't happen normally in the wild at all. Uh, now, what is the difference? What difference gets set up in those circumstances? Um, if a mother gives the baby to somebody else as a carer, then immediately a selection pressure for all this creation of, of, of looking and gestures and sounds and checking each other out, checking out each other's eyes. So if I hand my baby to Robin, I, Robin's going to be looking at the baby and going goo 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 and the baby's going to be looking at Robin and trying to get him to smile and the baby's going to be looking, where's mama? And, and I'm looking at Robin, it's, everything's all right. And we're, so you're getting a kind of interaction, three-way interaction, where each of the individuals in that triangle has to gauge the intentions of the others, has to try and consolidate and, and be really o overt about their emotional states. As soon as that happens, the selection pressures are set up. Why don't great apes do it? Wouldn't it be a good thing for great ape mothers to have a break? I'm sure that many of them would love it because great ape mothers are single mums who do all the work themselves. Um, they just can't risk it. Herdy describes the great ape mothers as hyper-possessive. They hang on to their babies um, because they can't risk it. Why not? They do not live with female relatives. They do not live with their mums or their sisters. Now the situation with monkeys, and if we, Sarah Herdy looked at monkeys first, she was looking at langurs. The situation amongst langurs where there is close female relationship is different. We get babysitting with monkeys because monkeys live with female relatives. But with great apes, not. Um, so this is telling us if this story of the emergence of intersubjectivity, and it is really the, most, the best story going, if this story is true, it says necessarily that we in our hominin, in our evolutionary past, were living with female kin. Mothers were living where their female kin were. Okay, um, and so this really, the, Sarah Hurdy's model is a combination of Michael Tomasello's understanding of intersubjectivity um, amongst human children compared with great apes, for instance, and the famous grandmother hypothesis. Um, so she's brought in the grandmother hypothesis to put it into this framework of what she calls cooperative childcare. Cooperative childcare becomes the matrix for our evolved psychology. Okay. Now, let's just give a just mention. I'll just show this quickly without going into any elaboration. But amongst African foragers, um, the marriage and residence patterns, we did mention multi-local residence as, as a feature of, of egalitarian hunter-gatherers, but this has a life history um, that uh, when a mother is very young, when she's having her first child and probably the second child, she is very likely to be living with her mother. In amongst all the African hunter-gatherers, we have evidence in population genetics and in residence data from the Hadza um, population genetics from Central Africa and uh, Southern Africa. Um, so this is a, a lovely Hadza grandmother with, who is living with her daughter and has all these grandchildren here with her, and that is typical. 
uh, later on in a woman's reproductive career, or maybe that's later, maybe her own mother is not so is, is, is not alive anymore, she may be moving to other places, to her husband's camp and so forth, that this initial status of living with her mother is obviously very critical and important for. Now the mechanism, this is perhaps the stamp of egalitarianism on human bodies. The mechanism which supports intersubjectivity, which supports our ability to read the mind of another and allow that other person into our own thoughts, is the so-called um, cooperative eye. Um, humans have eyes that are designed completely differently from every other primate species every other single species of primate. Um, we're looking at a collection of young great apes. So these are young individuals uh, with their eyes and we can see a standard form of the eyes. Basically they are round, they're very round in shape. There is hardly any s sign of, of a lighter um, part of the iris uh, uh, around there, a little bit of the whites there, but they're very dark and round. And with that, um, with that shape, it's quite hard to tell. It's quite hard to tell what is the what is the ape looking at. As soon as you go to this design, which belongs to all humans on the planet, um, but I take African default here, um, we have this very almond shape uh, with the bright white sclera with the iris very dark against that and it just makes it so easy to look at somebody look at something else gesture with your eyes show anybody that you want to show what what are you interested in what are you thinking of even just for primates looking into their eyes it's it's a threat to look straight in the eyes of most primates and um, for us it's, the op it's quite the opposite of that. It's inviting an extraordinary level of, of intimacy and inviting the other to, to sense what we're feeling. So this is, you know, th this is an impossible thing to envisage, the evolution of this kind of eye, unless there is significant level of egalitarianism and equality and no kind of threat. You can only have this evolving where there really is safe space, you know, where there really is safety in the, the, the types of relationships where, the, where uh, the, the eye mechanism is being used, the intersubjectivity. For, for the apes, it isn't a surprise, and for the monkeys also, it is no surprise that they are wanting to know what the other apes are doing, but they're not allowing others to read their minds very easily. Um, because they're living in very Machiavellian and very competitive circumstances. Uh, so this is just saying something different happened in our evolution. Something different happened for hominins um, that, that enabled those eyes to evolve. Okay, now we can start to think, what am I doing for time? We can start to think about how and when this egalitarianism changed um, when did these cooperative eyes and did the egalitarianism, the intersubjectivity and the uh, babysitting that Sarah Hurley's talking about, when was it evolving? Okay. Um, so this sketch is coming from uh, work done by Andy Whiten. I think actually the sketch was done by Bruce Nauft. Yeah. Um, but it's an idea, it's this kind of rough hypothetical sketch of start over here. This is, e this is back in evolutionary time. We're looking at like the ancestor of us and great apes. So a common ancestor with the chimps and bonobos, maybe gorillas too. Pretty hierarchical, rank organized societies with dominant individuals, beaters and gammas, and a lot of strife and plenty of Machiavellian cooperation as well. Remember that. These are very Machiavellian intelligent animals we'll talk about in a moment. But it's hierarchical, okay? So it's carrying on, carrying on, carrying on then something causes that to start changing and, we, and it's on this slope that we can envisage intersubjectivity, babysitting, cooperative childcare, uh, cooperative eyes beginning to emerge. So they haven't tried to put any time frame here, they're just giving it a kind of sketch and saying well that's happening. Now what they, they imagine is that 
coming, this is the cause of the evolution of human hunter-gatherers. This is where human hunter-gatherers are kind of maxing out as the ultimate in egalitarianism. And what that time frame is, well, the origins of human hunter-gatherers, they, they're supposing maybe it's Homo sapiens. I probably agree with that, or a bit older than that. And then this bit, that's history. That is the farmers. That is the pastorate. That's history, capitalism, all that bit. So this bit is evolved psychology, is under natural selection. That is under like class society and history. Right, that, that's genes. different. So this isn't changed by genes. Yeah, Arif? One of the, one of the assumptions they make, it, it seems like a very sort of speculative um, Well, the Erdl and Whiten, um, so it's these guys work they taking uh, they are looking for universal characteristics of hunter gatherers and they identified what they call counter dominance and, vi um, and they particularly focused on food economics vigilant sharing and demand sharing and they said look any hunter gatherers you go to you will find these counter dominance and they had a very good scholarly sample with a lot of literature to these are, are evolutionary psychologists but they did a good job for evolutionary psychologists they do a good job uh, <laughs> so um, the more than that they had this but you know that Andy Whiten is the father one of the fathers of Machiavellian intelligence theory which is the predecessor of social brain so they have a beautiful argument about how does egalitarianism emerge, which is a Darwinian argument. It's a very clever argument. So Machiavellian intelligence is the idea amongst apes and monkeys that in order to compete, you need to cooperate. You need to get allies, and you need to work with those allies to be able to be better, better at getting resources, better at getting sex, etc. So it's a really subtle idea. You compete to cooperate, you cooperate to compete. Machiavellian intelligence. Okay, so the, the more that you get Machiavellian intelligence, which, which goes with brain size, with neocortex size, okay, the more you can make alliances, which means the more Machiavellian intelligence you have, the more difficult it is for any one animal to be able to dominate. It becomes harder and harder. And then they say you get a kind of flipping point. You get a flip where it is no longer possible for one individual to dominate the others and at that point the best strategy is just to settle for making sure you are not dominated you just make sure nobody can put you down they don't dominate you so you uh, it, that leads to a rough and ready egalitarianism in that sense um, so this is a neat argument it's very clever and so that this is just hyper it's this hypothetical sketch they're just giving you know putting their their theory into practice they're taking it to the furthest extent um, and it's a cool idea counter dominance describes what we really know about hunter gatherers demand sharing um, keeping an eye out in case anybody tries to hoard some supplies um, laughing and mockery if anyone's above themselves doing masamba doing moajo whatever it might be um, and Whiten wrapped this into what he calls deep social mind, which is really into subjectivity in terms of, of um, uh, Sarah Hurdy and Michael Tomasello. But he said deep social mind, he put the politics into there and he said you have to have egalitarianism as part of it. You can't do into subjectivity if there are differences of hierarchy and rank with people. You're not going to let them look into your eyes if that's the case. Um, so he wrapped together as co-evolution mutual mind reading into subjectivity with egalitarianism and cultural transmission and all of those things could work together and they depended on each other. That was his argument of deep social mind. I think it's a neat argument. We can do better than that in deciding where does um, by we can do better than than being vague by looking at this and this is really the part um, this is really the aspect of our anatomy which is so different from great apes it's so ma you know, hugely different from great apes um, in that uh, great ape this is looking at brain size the brain volume a great ape brain volume is basically down here 
um, and all these Australopithecine, Ardipithecus early hominin species and all their descendants, Paranthropines, even down to Homo naledi, which would be down around here, there, all of them are basically great ape brain sizes. Okay? Um, this here is what's termed by Isler and Van Schaik the grey ceiling. Great ape mothers said they can't hand their babies to anybody because they have no female relative to trust. They have to do the entire work themselves. Males are worse than useless. They're a hindrance and a possible risk. Some of you may have, uh, have seen that, that horrendous film or read about the incidents of the poor chimp mother who gave birth with the others in the group and some male just swiped her baby and ate it within about half, within a few minutes. Um, so chimpanzee mothers have to go on maternity leave to give birth so that they're not near anybody. Yeah. Um, so males are worse than useless and we have no reason to believe these, these species have, did anything else except ape motherhood with single mothers. Something happened two million years ago, just after two million years ago, smashing through the grey ceiling, just smashed through. Um, in this species, which is early genus Homo, and this is large brain, large bodied Homo erectus, that we've got more than twice the volume of a chimpanzee brain size. Mothers had to have others. We have to have grandmothers, mothers, mothers, female kin bonds. We have to have the beginnings of cooperative eyes. We have to have, you know, de starting to be, ten tending to be egalitarian tendency. So this slope. That, that he has here has to go with two million, it has to go with Homo erectus somewhat. It's constrained by the amount of energy required to get through the grey ceiling, basically. Um, so that carries on, and then something even more incredible happens. It's this with 600, 700,000 years this rise of brain size going three times bigger than chain volume and keeping going, it goes far, far more than that. We have come down a bit in average brain size since then, which is saying that the amount of energy available to mothers and babies here in the evolution of both ourselves and Neanderthals are like our shadow experiment um, was phenomenal. It was so much. We can give this as an index of gender egalitarianism. There's more, the more that you put into brain size, the more that mothers are receiving in terms of energy for their offspring, the more the gender egalitarianism. It's that simple. I don't think it's, it's, it's measurable in that case. So I've tried to just draw against that a kind of negative correlation of, of dominance versus the rise in brain size. So we, that is positive of egalitarianism against the rise of brain size. We're going to have the, the slope down with um, Homo erectus, some stabilization, and then something much, you know, a, a real change. And this maximization of egalitarianism down here um, the, at the time period uh, that leads to modern humans. Okay. Um, it's just tracing how dominance and egalitarianism. Yep. It's in reverse. Yeah. It's, it's reversing from the brain size because the more you have large brains for mothers and offspring, you do, the more you do. The, 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 the lower the line, the more the egalitarianism. Yeah. And the higher the line, the more the... So it, it's, draw, it's drawing that chart, but much more precisely against a brain actual f fossil evidence. Time, goes the other way. time is, yeah, it's going differently, yeah, sorry about that. But we can flip it, we're good at that. Um, okay, so this has to be gendered. Um, somehow those, those females are gaining uh, so, so much extra energy. Um, the best answer to where that extra energy is coming from is males are getting organized to become routine investors into these large-brained offspring, plus also cooking. Cooking technology is coming um, in as a regularity into there. Um, that would make a lot of difference as well. But you've got to have something to cook. You, 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 you've got to get the males organized to get something to cook. Okay, so how do the females do that? And this is the other aspect. So far I've said um, cooperative eyes, 
the size of the brains, uh, life history in terms of grandmothers, mothers, mothers, uh, the life history of the menopause itself, of course, is wrapped up in that. The life history of childhood itself, stages of life history, um, and um, our non-submissive evolved psychology are all markers of our egalitarian deep time past. Okay? Um, but this is like a killer. It's female sexual physiology is also designed, our reproductive physiology is designed to level reproductive success amongst males and to waste the time of males as much as possible. Okay? Um, so many people have seen this before, but we're now looking at it from the perspective of egalitarianism. So if we think of monkeys and apes, um, particularly great apes, um, males will have a huge difference in their likely fitness outcomes. The, the, the main import or the main outcome of rank difference amongst male apes is that some males have a lot of fitness, a lot of reproductive success, other males have very little indeed. So there's a wide range of difference. When we come to hunter-gatherers, um, this is actually quantifiable and measurable if we use uh, population genetics on Y chromosomes with hunter-gatherer populations, you will see an extraordinary variety of Y chromosome lineages um, for hunter-gatherers. Y lineages are various for the Hadza, for instance. And that means that nearly every man is having offspring. Nearly every single man. You would not get that with great apes, that every single male has offspring. Okay. How do females do it? They're spreading the chances amongst a lot. Now, why would they want to do it? They want to do it because well, it's what uh, the Bayaka say. One woman, one penis, they say, as Ingrid and Jerome taught us. Um, because every woman, far from being a single mum and a great ape, every woman, if a male is useful, every woman needs one. Okay? So, they need to share around the chances of sex and the chances of fertility with as many men as possible, um, to as many men as possible, and undermine any attempt by males to dominate and keep harems. They don't want that. If you need lots of food to ensure that your large-brained offspring gains, you know, get, can grow up, you can't possibly remain in a harem with a dominant male. It doesn't work. Um, so this design of, of humans, of women, uh, for continue, concealed ovulation that's unpredictable, um, it's very difficult for, if you have a boyfriend uh, does it, and you're, you're a woman, does your boyfriend know when you're fertile or ovulating? I bet you he doesn't. You might, you might think he does, but he, he'd be very confused about it. And he's meant to be confused about it. He's also confused by the fact that we have a greater proportion of our cycles as sexual receptive. Almost any time of cycle can be sexually receptive. So there is very little clue for males about when is a female fertile. We're, we're designed to really confuse that issue. We've been designed by human evolution to confuse it. Scrambles the, the information to the males about the moments of fertility, which means that if males are interested in getting a female pregnant, they've got to hang around. And if you've got to hang around a long time with one female, then it's very difficult to be a harem male and to guard one female. And whilst, whilst you're busy with one female, then some other male is going to be busy with any of the others. So this is undermining the a dominant male monopoly of keeping many females. And as I said, the Bayaka have this ritual chant, one woman, one penis, which is part of their, their very um, important Ngoku uh, fertility spirit rituals. Okay, so the other thing, how, how long should I go on? Maybe we should so have a joke. Uh, I'm going to uh, wind up with symbolism and then just say how symbolism got there. Is that it? Symbolism and language itself. I like this bit because it's kicking graver in the... <laughs> again. Um, symbolism and language itself require egalitarianism. So far I've been talking about biology, um, aspects of anatomy, 
or psychology, but actually our symbolic cognition, the use of symbolism, is dependent on a, a level of trust that could only be fostered by egalitarianism. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to invoke from cultural anthropologists, American cultural anthropologists, well Victor Turner's you know, British social anthropologist, but just cultural anthropologists talking about the symbolic because they are the experts, Symbol social anthropologists, the experts of symbolic. Um, so Salins, when he used to do co uh, comparisons of, uh, of hunt-gatherers, egalitarian hunt-gatherers with the societies of apes and, and monkeys, he did that in, back in the 1960s. And he has this quote, culture is the oldest equalizer. Among animals capable of symbolic communication, the weak can collectively connive to overthrow the strong, he notes. So he's talking about about hunter-gatherer politics. But I think it should be the other way around. It's because the weak can collectively overthrow the strong, because we have counter-dominant alliances, that we are capable of symbolic communication. That is really the way around it goes. Um, Victor Turner's noticing the powers of the weak are always central and crucial in ritual and ceremonial sacred aspects. But this is the one I really like, this one from Graeber. I'm sorry if the people at the back can't. It is quoted um, in my little pamphlet, if you want to grab that for a quid, um, if you like it. It comes from Fragment of Anarchist Anthropology. He, he copies this passage in many places he's written it. But, but uh, yeah, he, keeps, he does copy and paste, like the rest of us. Um, it, he's talking about the powers of the bureaucratic state and the stupidity and idiocy of the bureaucratic state that doesn't have to think about what people are feeling. Yes, but actually what he's saying applies beautifully to the evolution of language too, quite simply. If you have the power to hit people over the head whenever you want, you don't have to trouble yourself much figuring out what they think is going on. Therefore, generally speaking, you don't. Hence, the surefire way to simplify social arrangements, to ignore the incredibly complex play of perspectives, passions, insights, desires, and mutual understandings that human life is really made of, is to make a rule and threaten to attack anyone who, is, who breaks it. Okay, so he's talking about the bureaucratic state, make it with its stupid arbitrary fines and regulations and that people, the normal human beings can't, can't understand. But what he is talking, what he's mentioning here, this complex play of passions and perspectives is everything that we've been saying about intersubjectivity, about this mutual capacity of understanding each other's point of view, the empathy, um, being able to put ourselves into others' shoes and negotiate and, 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 and work out our mutual situation. It is about language requiring consensual process and safe space to operate. Language doesn't operate in any other way. You can't, you can't do the evolution of language without the evolution of safe space, is what we were saying, what I was saying earlier. Um, and he's got it in one, except that he thinks he's talking about the state, and he thinks, and this is where he's going wrong, you know, silence was going wrong because he's putting it the wrong way around. Grabe is going wrong because he thinks that rules come from dominant individuals trying to give themselves an excuse to bash people up. But I don't think any dominant chimpanzee ever needed to give themselves an excuse to bash people up. They just bash people up. They don't need to find an excuse to do it. Um, so rules are not going to be made up first by dominant individuals in hierarchies. They're more likely to be made up first by the the but as aspects of powers of the weak to, to protect those who are weaker rather than um, you know, used to give more power to those who are powerful. Um, okay, and what are, we, oh, what are we gonna do now? Can we carry on a little bit more? Mm, yeah. What should we do? Just, just a little bit more to try and tie up on um, yeah, on Bohm's uh, reverse dominance and then our model and then we can talk about it. I'm sorry it's gone a bit long because I started with a bit of a spiel at the moment. So where do these, yeah, where does morality itself come from? We heard a lot from Mourner on the corporeal um, organic morality last, last uh, week. Um, 
Christopher Byrne, alongside the counter-dominance model, which was purely Darwinian, purely um, kind of individualistic idea of resisting being dominated, was counter-dominance. Boom opens that up to what he calls uh, reverse dominance. This comes from Hierarchy in the Forest. And it's again a very simple story. Two types of primate coalition. You've got alliances that, may, that maintain dominance. So the alpha maybe goes to the gamma to keep the beta in their place. That's about maintaining dominance and status quo. Or you get alliances that resist dominance. Now that might be the gamma and the beta ganging up against the alpha, but they might also need to take all those under them as well. Now what Bohm is suggesting is that with primates you basically keep on sort of mixing between those two. But what happened with us with, in the situation of increasingly egalitarian hunting gathering uh, uh, economies, we generated what was called reverse dominance. Um, morality came from a wholesale coalition of everyone against someone who tried to become the alpha male and everybody else uh, as what with collective intentionality, what Thomas Sutter or John Searle would call we intentionality, became a kind of moral group resisting that so he sees this as, a, it's a kind of Durkheimian moral collective here, resisting uh, someone who tries to dominate. Okay. Um, it's a very abstract model. Who are these alphas? What, what are they doing? How are they trying to be alpha? Who are the rebels? Who are resisting them? Why are these strategies constantly repeated? How do they become so ingrained in us? Why are they constantly repeated? So what I want to do is to gender that model. I'm just going to put gender into it and we'll come out with something. Um, so let's go back to our sexual signals. We said concealed ovulation, sexual receptivity, scrambles the information to males. Males don't know when females are fertile. This was a very important part of females maintaining reproductive egalitarianism, keeping one male each. Okay, but the trouble is menstruation. Menstruation is always the trouble. Menstruation gets the blame for everything. It's a, rely it's a giveaway, a reliable cue. Female isn't now pregnant. She can be made pregnant in the near future. So she, that menstrual female, is the target. Any male in a Darwinian world is interested in a menstrual female. Menstruation causes conflict amongst the female group because the menstruating female might be able to take male investment away from the females who are pregnant and breastfeeding, the females who need the most energy. And it's going to cause conflict amongst the males too, because all the males are interested to find that, you know, get close to, bring flowers, offer chocolates to that menstrual girl or woman. So I'm just jumping you through this. You've seen this a number of times, probably in the past, so I don't need to argue it very closely. Um, as soon as there's one menstruating female, and we've got to remember that for hunter-gatherers, menstruation is relatively rare. Women are pregnant, breastfeeding, menopausal. Most of the female population will be. Uh, menstrual cycling is relatively rare, so it will cause, it will get a lot of attention. And the males are very, very interested because it means the female's fertile. These females have to solve that problem. They've got to work out what to do about it. They can try to hide it, but hiding won't work very well necessarily. Even hiding draws attention, doesn't it? So the best thing is to do that. The best thing is to join the menstruant and make a big display out of it. And that is the Himba modeling beautifully um, the so-called female cosmetic coalition strategy. They are demonstrating in very clear terms their unity, their solidarity. Um, they are establishing themselves as a moral collective, as inviolable. The men must back off and be respectful. They can't just go in there and mess with them. Um, everything suddenly gets solved by that. The competition amongst the females is sorted out and therefore the competition amongst the males is sorted out. To the extent that these, these females are solid, 
the males are going to be solid. Now, if any alpha male does try and charge in there and try and grab, well, she's the one who's really menstruating, actually, the males who are willing investors are not going to be happy with that. We're going to get exactly what Christopher Burns said. We're going to get the coalition of everyone against an alpha male who tries to break that down. And in fact, the males who are willing investors, who are the ones who are going to do bride service and, su and support the bride and bring the meat back to the coalition, they will be sexually selecting these females because these females are eliminating alpha males from the competition. And they are settling, they are demanding a reproductive egalitarianism, fundamental reproductive egalitarianism with bride service. As, as part of that. Um, how, yeah, we've got a whole series of predictions on that which we can talk about, including the ochre, arch the archaeology of the ochre, and so forth. Um, and the archaeology of the ochre, I'm going to skip through. But this is really, this is really where the cosmology of the symbolic of all these concepts, these, tra these transformative potency concepts. Um, Aquila Epime are stemming from, they're stemming from this symbolic construction of the female refusal. Now, D Graeber has this lovely phrase of the, of, um, the cult culture as creative refusal. Well, this is the original culture as creative refusal. Wrong species, wrong sex, wrong time is the way females tell males no. We know in the era of Me Too, we know that males aren't very good at hearing no from females um, because female bodies have evolved over evolutionary time to be super attractive to keep males hanging around. So telling them no and making them go away hunting is a big job. It requires rituals, days of rituals, days of singing and dancing. The girls in the menstrual hut, the women are all, all around her dancing this ancient music. They are actually with red ochre as well. We can't see it very, very clearly. Um, they are doing this little mating dance where they're, they are elan bull, they're elans, the mighty antelope, the elan, the mighty santhrope for Africa. Um, they're mating with the girl herself is the elan bull. They have these horns which are used to poke the men, keep them at a good distance. The young Hadza women in Maitoko, um, have the mythology they identify with a matriarchal ancestress who used to have a, a bow and arrow and hunt zebra and when she got a male zebra and then she would cut off the penis and tie it on herself so these girls are either the wives of Man Bedoko or they're, they're, they're actually Man Bedoko herself um, so we have these these menstrual rituals this Elan bull dance is probably the prototype of human ritual or stretches back an ancestry all the way so this is Maitoko again um, and Ngoku uh, for the Bayaka where we have an extraordinary um, pantomiming of women's of women pantomiming male behavior as they establish the ground um, for uh, their rituals of the Ngoku fertility spirit um, and they're dancing in these militant dance formations. So no man is coming anywhere. Jerome Ingrid has taken these pictures from a long way off because he can't go close, can he? Um, and uh, the, the older women are showing the young women um, what, how, how um, badly behaved men are by acting out male sexual ineptitude. So there is a lot of hilarity a mimicry and ridicule and mockery which is leveling down the men as part of the Ngoku as well as it being you know very sacred and secret for um, and empowering for the women. Um, okay so we're, we're getting this uh, that, that's just more on the Elan bull dance um, aspects of female solidarity group solidarity and um, from Central Africa um, mechanisms by which women are creating that solidarity and asserting their egalitarianism um, as just fundamental core aspects of African hunter-gatherer life. Um, but the, the biggest 
uh, thing to emerge from these female strategies is symbolic culture um, itself, metaphor itself, language itself as this capacity of sharing meaning and constantly changing, shifting and sharing meanings as this creative uh, ability of language itself um, and I, yeah I won't go into that we'll leave, we'll leave the um, upper paleolithic that was something that had to do with um, Wenger and Graeber um, just to say that um, we were listening to Mona last week who co-edited with me this volume the human origins uh, contributions in social anthropology um, and I think that's enough sorry to go so long thank you